Hi everyone, I think we'll go ahead and get started. So we'll have ample time at the end for questions. So today we have a great talk by Dr. Maury Blinder. Uh, just to give some brief background on him, he went to medical school at St. Louis University, uh, residency at University of Illinois School of Medicine, followed by fellowship at the University of Washington. He then came to the Better Washington and did postdoctoral research here at Washington University in St. Louis, where he has since stayed on at faculty and now he's a professor in the Division of Hematology. So we have a great talk today and we're really excited to welcome Dr. Blender. Everybody hear me okay? My phone's on, good. Well, welcome to everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, I, this really is an honor for me to be able to do this. Think about some of the other speakers that have been here even this year already. It's been quite a list. So I'm, I'm really pleased to be here. And this will be a pretty clinical talk. We're gonna focus on iron deficiency anemia. And we'll talk a little bit about iron in health and, and then in some disease. We're not gonna talk about iron overload or really esoteric parts of iron metabolism. We'll really focus on basic iron homeostasis and then and then iron uh, deficiency anemias and how they fit in. So this is a, uh, a schematic of, of earth. Um, and in the middle, it's been known for a while that the center of earth is almost all iron with a little bit of nickel. And what's recently been described is that not only is it a molten iron, but it actually has a spin to it. And uh, it affects how earthquakes are and other events on the surface of Earth. So this is a really active area of seismology. But it's also interesting to me that that iron is the most common element in or on Earth, and it's also the most common malady of humans to be iron deficient. So there's a lot of iron, but we don't always have enough of it. Over a billion people suffer from iron deficiency, at least in the world right now. So what we will talk about today then is a little bit about just uh, basic iron homeostasis, how we absorb and transport and utilize iron. It's a really active area of research and, and it dovetails into some newer clinical opportunities to improve iron deficiency anemia and, and as well as iron overload. We'll talk about iron deficiency, some of the causes and the laboratory approaches to it and then treatment. Um, the role of oral and IV iron is something that we think about a lot. And I'll try to add a little bit of light to that. And, and then again, the most prevalent medical condition in the world is iron deficiency. And at least 1.2 billion people are iron deficient today. So a good place to start is to think about basic iron metabolism and how we take iron in. And that's what's shown here. Uh, this is uh, normal duodenum taking in dietary iron. Most of the or the iron that is absorbed is all in the proximal small intestine. So the duodenum in the earliest uh, portion of the jejunum. Um, so it's a really small area. So diseases that uh, part of the intestinal tract can lead to iron deficiency. We A normal American diet has 10 or 15 milligrams of iron in our diet. We absorb roughly 10% of that iron. So we're taking it about a milligram or two per day where it travels to the plasma to bind to transferrin. Most of that iron then is shuttled to the bone marrow to make new red blood cells. Red blood cells become senescent after about 100 days, then the iron is scavenged in the RE system, mostly in the spleen, and then reutilized. If we have extra iron, it goes to the liver, um, and we have some balance of iron in muscle too. So when you are iron deficient, you can start depleting muscle. Myoglobin iron can account for some of iron deficiency symptoms. And then we slough or lose about a milligram or two in, in our uh, normal body fluids. Um, and so we should be balanced, uh, taking in about the amount we, we lose every day. Now, if we dig down a little bit deeper, how we absorb the iron in our intestinal tract, that's what's shown here. So on the far side of the slide is the lumen of the intestine. We take in iron in two ways. The Most of the iron that's actually absorbed is in the form of heme iron, so which is in muscle fibers, so myoglobin or heme iron, so meats, um, and there are some plant-based uh, irons as well uh, in heme, but the, the remainder of the iron comes in as non-heme iron, which would be plant material, some nuts and other, other food stuff that we eat. There are two different transporters that bring the iron into the 
uh, intestinal epithelial cells. So there's this heme transporter that brings it in directly. This is the most efficient way to get iron in. And there's also this divalent metal transporter that brings in iron as well as other metals into the epithelium. Some of the iron is lost. You do form a little bit of uh, ferritin in the epithelial cells that are then sloughed, but that's not a very efficient way to regulate uh, iron. You don't really regulate how your epithelium or sloughed. So, so this happens, but it doesn't really aid in iron balance. And then at the other side of the epithelial cells of the GI tract are the, uh, is the exporter, which is called fer ferroportin. It is the only human exporter of iron that there is. So it's a real key protein that we have. Um, there's another protein called Hephaestin. If any of you know Greek mythology, Hephaestin was the, uh, is the Greek god of, of metals. That's how it got its name. Uh, you may be more familiar with Vulcan, which is the Roman god of, of metals. The iron is uh, oxidized from fer ferrous to ferric iron. It's transported bound to transferrin. Most of it goes to the erythroid, to, to bone marrow, to make growing red blood cells. This also regulates how much iron we reabsorb or reabsorb. So the iron is bound to transferrin and that will bind to the surface of the liver. There is a receptor for that, and that will increase or decrease hepcidin. Hepcidin is the critical regulatory protein here. It binds to ferroportin. When hepcidin is high, it degrades ferroportin. It gets internalized into the cells, and it's lost, so you can't bring any more iron in. When hepcidin is low, the opposite happens. The ferroportin, the door is open, the port is open, and more and more iron pours in. So that is the main regulatory approach to how we get iron into our system. If we go through then a little bit more metabolism, transferrin is a binding protein. It's made in the liver and it binds to two uh, iron molecules and that is our main transporter in the bloodstream. So we think about a TIBC, we measure that all the time. That's just a functional assay, mostly for transferrin. So you can measure transferrin, but um, there are, other diseases of transferrin, sometimes there are other transporters that account for some of the iron transport. So when we measure TIBC, we're mostly measuring transferrin, but not totally. And you don't really need to measure transferrin directly, although there is an assay for that. And then here's what happens internally. So I've now put the iron transferrin at the center of the slide that's circulating in the bloodstream. Uh, and most of this iron then will go to the uh, to the bone marrow to make new red cells. Uh, and then those will be recirculated mostly to scavenge the iron. And then this is in balance with the amount of uh, hepcidin that's made in the liver. And hepcidin does two things. It blocks ferroportin on the intestinal cells, the, the duodenal cells, ferroportin, so you can't absorb more iron. And it also blocks release of macrophage iron. So macrophages also have a ferroportin uh, the iron exporters, and that will also be blocked by high hepcidin. So higher hepcidin levels block iron reutilization as well as uh, absorption, and low hepcidin does the opposite. And that's the way we regulate uh, iron predominantly through this hepcidin pathway. We don't have any other way to regulate hepcidin or uh, iron through any um, uh, increased iron loss, for example. So we can start thinking about uh, I, anemias, at times, you can think of them as if they're hepcidin deficient or hepcidin high. And I think that'll become more important as hepcidin inhibitors are developed. So you have a high hepcidin state, which occurs in anemia of chronic disease, say in cancer. There are hepcidin inhibitors that are being developed uh, in clinical trials to lower the hepcidin level, uh, try to avoid the anemia that occurs in inflammatory disease, uh, autoimmune disease, and cancer. And then there are low hepcidin states. So iron deficiency is a low hepcidin state. You wanna bring in as much iron as you can. So you, you shut off hepcidin production. And then if you have increased iron demand, you wanna shut off the hepcidin. You wanna be able to, to bring in as much iron as possible. If I was a frequent blood donor, for example, and I was depleting my iron, my hepcidin would be close to zero. And then the last sort of regulatory step here is just the, uh, uh, ferritin. So that is our storage molecule for iron. It is uh, regulated to control a, a, the absorption of iron and the, the um, or in the, the storage of iron. Um, the excretion of iron, again, is not regulated, but hep, hep, um, oops, 
uh, ferritin is a big molecule, many thousands of uh, subunits here. There's a light chain and a heavy chain. And I think you get the sense in this image that this blue allows for channels to bring in iron uh, and then it's stored in the middle of, of the uh, ferritin molecule and then it can be released as needed. And it binds iron inclusively. It doesn't bind any other uh, cations. So it doesn't bind calcium or magnesium or any of the other metals that we need for normal, normal uh, physiology. So kind of in summary then, where is iron? So most of our iron is in hemoglobin. Two thirds to three fourths of all the iron in our body is in the in the form of hemoglobin. It binds to the protoporphyrin to make heme, and that binds to globin. There is a significant uh, component of myoglobin. The amount in uh, storage, which is bound to ferritin, mostly in the liver, is quite variable. It can be close to zero, or it can be just about zero, or you can have say up to about a thousand milligrams or a gram of iron in storage in the liver. And really a very small amount of iron is actually in transit at any time. So very little of it is actually circulating through the bloodstream in the bound to uh, transferrin. So an average person has three or four grams and that's shown here uh, in this pie diagram. Men have more iron than women, but basically for two reasons. One is size, more muscle mass. So if you had, say, a 150-pound man and a 150-pound woman, th their uh, circles would be more similar in size. The other difference is the storage iron. For women of uh, childbearing age, uh, the, the storage irons are almost always lower because of menstrual bleeding, blood loss, and, and pregnancy, it, it really cuts into the amount of storage iron that women have available to, to be called upon if needed. So let's do a little bit of iron math now to try to summarize this. I think this has always been kind of interesting to me. Is, uh, so let, let's just go through it. So there's a couple of key numbers to just know, and they're in bold here. So one is about our blood volume is about 70 milliliters per kilogram until you get very obese and you have more fat where the, the it's quite as perfused uh, with as much blood. So it, it does go down a little bit, but in general, about 70 milliliters per kilogram. So if we just, to make the math simple, if we take a 72 kilogram person, that would be about five liters of blood. That's our blood volume, okay? And then how much of that is actually red cells? So if our hematocrit is 45, that means 45% of the blood volume is red cells. So that gives us about 2,200 milliliters of red blood cells. The other number that's just handy to know is that there's about a milligram of iron per milliliter of red blood cells. So that means we have 2,200 milligrams of iron circulating on average for, for a typical person. We also know that the retic count is about 1%. We turn over about 1% or one in 100 red cells every day. That's the survival of red cells. So that's that means that's 22 milligrams of iron turned over a day, per day. But in the first slide, remember I said that only one milligram of iron is absorbed each day. So that means 20 or so milligrams has to be recycled. So that recycled pathway is key to having normal iron homeostasis. Most of the iron that we have is recycled iron. And just to, to think, uh, as we sort of finish up this physiology, physiology part, it, what is hepcidin? So this is our uh, protein that binds to ferroportin, opens and closes the door to iron uh, uh, export from either epithelial cells or the RE system. It's a very small molecule. It was very hard to work with. It's almost like a little knot. It's got four disulfide bonds, so it's it's really tight, it's very well conserved in mammals, so it's hard to generate antibodies to do immunoassays. Um, and, and so it wasn't until 2000 that this was discovered um, and, and, um, and, and also sequenced, and, and now it's, it's a lot more known about it, obviously. And here's some, some of the early studies measuring hepcidin. So as you might predict, men have a higher hepcidin level than women, Women tend to have low iron, lower iron stores, so they need to absorb a little bit more iron, so their hepcidin on average is a little bit lower. And, and if you look at a graph of ferritin versus hepcidin, you'll see there's a rough linear relationship between the two. As the iron goes up, uh, as the ferritin goes up with extra iron, the hepcidin would go up because you don't need more iron, you make hepcidin 
keep the door closed so to limit the, the max amount of iron. And I think this is a really interesting slide from Tom Gans, who's been here to uh, give talks in, in the past. He's in, uh, in San Diego and has uh, um, done a lot of the biology and the understanding about um, uh, iron metabolism in general, and it's iodine in particular. So let's just say at point zero here, we've taken in uh, either an iron supplement or a, um, food stuff with iron in it. So we take in say 65 milligrams of iron. That's a fair amount of iron. That's more than a, uh, an average dose in, um, in, in a meal. And then the first thing that happens is the serum ferritin level will go up pretty quickly and you can measure that. The next thing that will happen is that the both the serum and then the urinary hepcidin will also go up. It'll be excreted fairly quickly, but you'll within a, a few hours, you'll have an increase in the hepcidin level. So you'll shut down the, the further absorption of iron. And this is, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but that's the reason that the idea of doing TID uh, iron supplements has really faded. This, this article that came out that showed this almost instantaneously changed people's thinking about doing TID iron. Because after you take that first dose of iron, the hepcidin is up, the rest of that iron is not going to be absorbed very effectively. Okay, so let's move on from the physiology now and we'll talk about iron deficiency. So this is uh, some older data looking from the NHANES study, which is a nutritional survey that's done. It, it includes a lot of different uh, aspects of nutrition, um, and it's been done several times. The most recent is the NHANES 4, which was in 2016. And if we just look at iron in particular, so in uh, infants greater than one year of age, they about 7% of uh uh, infants are iron deficient after about a year of age. Usually before that, there's enough iron brought over from the mother to be able to uh, supplement the iron. But as the baby is growing, their muscle mass and plasma and blood volumes are increasing. They can become iron deficient. And there's no difference on the NHANES 4 study. It's 7% of iron of, of infants are iron deficient. If you look at women of childbearing age, it's the highest risk of iron deficiency up to about 12% uh, or so of women are iron deficient. And that's in the United States where we really have essentially unlimited access to iron and meats and supplements that contain iron. And still many women can become iron deficient, uh, particularly during the child childbearing age. It's also been seen that uh, minorities and people of lower socioeconomic status, probably related more to nutrition than anything, also are risk factors for iron deficiency. And lastly, in older patients, iron deficiency is an important cause of anemia in the elderly. So if we work up uh, iron deficiency or anemia is just in older people, roughly a third of the, of the anemias that we see are going to be related to iron deficiency. And then there's a whole other hodgepodge of other anemias that can occur, myelodysplasias and, and many different things, obviously. But iron deficiency is an important part of this as well. And just, I won't talk too much about global health, but I just want to keep this on people's radar. So anemia is a, is a, a massive global problem. Um, and with respect to just anemia itself, uh, children uh, worldwide, uh, as many as half are anemic. Um, and, and then there's some with severe anemia, say hemoglobin less than eight. Similarly, non-pregnant women and then pregnant women have a very high risk of anemia. Um, so this is a global problem. And then the World Health Organization has estimated that roughly half or close to half of the anemias in the third world are due to iron deficiency. So a lot of people that are iron deficient that can be can be impacted uh, and improve their health. Um, so I just wanna show one quick uh, international slide. This is um, from uh, Pat Wolf, who was a pediatrician here, is still here, um, and was instrumental in developing these supplements that were used uh, in predominantly in Haiti. And she's spoken at this uh, grand round series in years past, looking at global health and iron deficiency. I think the problem with trying to do iron deficiency in, in internationally is, first of all, you don't need any lab testing because so many people are iron deficient. It doesn't. It's not worth trying to measure irons and TIBCs and ferritins 
because most of the people are going to be iron deficient. And the other piece of this is that there, it's not in a, in a vacuum that people are just iron deficient because they're eating well, but they're vegetarians, say. It, it is in, in association with many other health problems that go with it. But one of the things that she did was develop um, new food stuff for uh, people that, that um, needed nutrition and particularly iron. And she was the founder of this company, uh, Meds for Food for Kids, and they developed several nutrition products. Uh, many of them were peanut based. They were grown in Haiti so that um, not only did people get food, but many of the uh, farmers and local people learned skills and trades by developing these food products. Um, and the one that was used mostly for kids is shown here uh, on the far right. And this is a, a balanced peanut and milk protein based product, which has about a daily allotment of iron in it. So per, per hundred grams. So, so it's rich in iron. And um, there was an estimate I saw on their website that they treated over uh, 800,000 children with, with anemia and a, about a quarter of them were clearly iron deficient. So um, this organization is still working um, uh, 20 years later. She did find that um, in a study that was published mostly from here was that the anemia that you see in third world countries is multifactorial. It's, it, if you look, it's um, comparing, say, anemic children and non-anemic children. Um, there's not a lot of difference. The things that stood out was it was stunted growth, which means short stature related to poor nutrition and diarrheal illnesses were the biggest contributors to the anemia that they saw in their study. So I, I just wanted to keep that on people's radar screens. I think that's an important issue to, to keep in mind that we're seeing um, a small slice of the iron deficiency that's worldwide. And I think about that too with sickle cell disease, we're seeing a small slice of the sickle cell anemia that occurs worldwide. Um, and this is sort of a, a table that you might find in up to date or something like that. We're not gonna delve too much on this because I think people are pretty familiar with the causes of iron deficiency, but I'll just mention the category. So there are physiologic causes. So demands of pregnancy or adolescence when muscle mass is increasing dramatically. Um, uh, or in infancy, as I mentioned, the same growth spurt that occurs can render somebody iron deficient. Um, there may be poor intake, which could be for malnutrition, but it could also be from vegetarian-based uh, uh, diets because those are, they, while they do have a fair amount of iron in them, it's that non-heme iron that's more difficult to absorb. It's harder to pull the iron away from the, say, vegetable fibers than it is from meat to be absorbed successfully. Chronic blood loss is what we often think about in adult medicine and hematology as the cause of iron deficiency. And, and we'll talk briefly about some of the other conditions that are associated with iron deficiency. We won't really talk about chronic kidney disease because that's such a big topic in its own. And I remember Dan Coyne and others have talked about this in, in this uh, scenario as well. I do wanna bring up two, what I think are really fascinating topics related to iron. And these are some of the non-anemic symptoms that can occur with iron deficiency. And the first is pica, which is the genus for magpie. They're in the crow family, but they're, the genus is called pica. Um, they're, they're intelligent birds. I read that they are one of the only non-mammals that can recognize themselves in a mirror. So that's how you, I guess, define intelligence in the, in the animal world. Um, they, and they have a voracious appetite. And that was one of the characteristics. And, and that's where the term pica came from. It's not an acronym for anything. Um, and so people have this craving for, uh, for eating non-nutritional substances. The most common is ice, and that has its own separate name, which is pagophagia. But other things, often crunchy, are, are, the, um, uh, are, are shown here. The starch and dirt and clay, those are all common forms of pica. Um, and just in general, broadly, it occurs in about 25% of people with iron deficiency anemia, irrespective of the cause of the iron deficiency. Um, and I, I don't know if I've seen anybody uh, that gets referred to hematology because, oh, they've been eating ice. There must be something wrong. There may be people in this room that are eating ice, and you don't really think of it as a symptom of disease often, um, but, but it can be. And most of the people that have pagophagia are iron deficient. Not, not all, but most all. 
So here's some data from one study from a d blood donor. So healthy people that became iron deficient because they were they were in the 10 gallon club and they donated a lot of blood over the year, over their lifetime. And when you do a survey of those people, here's here are the characteristics that that fall out. So it's they describe eating ice as a craving. So people, you can ask them, do you have any cravings? Because that's the way they think of this ice eating. It's it's not like, oh, but I, I need to have as taste good every once in a while. It is a craving. You just chew ice by itself. That's common. And it's usually the small chips of ice. So um, typically it's from Sonic or QT. Those they have the the chipped ice. And I read that that Starbucks is going to these little chips of ice too. So we'll see if the uh, pattern changes. Um, people change their behavior to get ice. They will go through the drive-through over and over again, for example, to get ice, or they'll buy extra ice uh, uh, makers for their freezer at home, that sort of thing. Um, people some, sometimes sense that it's unusual. It can be noticed by, uh, by others. The most one dramatic example is that uh, a man saw his woman with her head in, his, in her freezer at home and she was in there sort of chipping ice and, and eating it out of the freezer directly. Um, so those are the kind of things that can happen. And sometimes these come to attention first from a dentist because of all the, the tooth chips that chipping that can occur from crunching down on ice all the time. So those are the, the characteristics of pica. It's not known on a molecular basis what happens, but it is known that as soon as you uh, replete the iron within a day or two. It's not related to the anemia. Within a day, people say, ah, I don't need ice anymore. So it's quite striking. The other symptom that I just want to mention is restless leg syndrome. Um, so there are four characteristics of this that uh, are uh, almost universally present. There's this urge to move your limbs because of the sensation, the, the bugs crawling or something like that. It's worse at rest. It's generally relieved by movement and it interferes with sleep. So these patients are often seen in a sleep center and, and the sleep physicians know that iron deficiency is one of the main causes, but not the only of restless leg syndrome. And there has been a fair amount of work looking at where the iron is in the brain and, and where it might be depleted. Most of the iron in our brain is in the substantia nigra, but it would be nice if there was um, uh, a way to know what, maybe what enzyme might be deficient that's iron dependent in the brain. People have looked at that, but I don't think anything is panned out yet. So there are some people that, um, that have both, and this is a recent study um, that was centered uh, in, in Boston, um, looking at older series with uh, iron deficiency and, and how many people have um, pica or pagophagia and it's uh, as high in some series as 55%. Um, so they looked at 1,000 consecutive patients. There's a, a physician in, in Baltimore affiliated with Hopkins who has his own iron deficiency clinic. That's what he does. And so that's where this most of this data came from. So they had pretty complete records on most of these patients. And they found that most of the patients with iron deficiency in his clinic were female. Uh, and about an equal number, I wouldn't have predicted this, but about an equal number had had either um, pica, pagophagia, or restless leg syndrome, and a significant number of patients had both. They didn't really find any correlation. So if you say there's a correlation with low MCV and a high TIBC, that would be a little bit misleading because if you look at the data, I don't think you would say there's a, a major difference here. This is just the TIBC data in, in individuals with and without pica, but with iron deficiency. The laboratory of diagnosis of iron deficiency can be quite straightforward. Um, we think about uh, the parameters in the iron, a microcytic anemia, the, uh, the iron parameters of a serum iron TIBC and the saturation, which are, which are straightforward. Iron that's easy to identify is easy. Easy irons are easy, hard irons are hard, and we'll talk about that in a minute. The ferritin has been known for, uh, for uh, what, almost 50 years now, to be the best non-invasive marker for, um, for iron deficiency. So in this case, it's comparing bone marrow iron, the gold standard for looking at iron levels uh, to a ferritin and low ferritin is very, very specific for iron deficiency. So another way to say that is there's almost nothing else that will give you a low um, ferritin except iron deficiency anemia. When you get to higher levels, it becomes a little bit more murky if somebody's iron deficient or, or not. 
And then a bone marrow exam would, would again be the gold standard. So at times iron deficiency is easy, but at times it's not. And I'll just show an example of that. Um, so this, these are three studies that looked at iron deficiency uh, in various settings. And I pulled out the data just with rheumatoid arthritis. But in these studies, they also had in patients with inflammatory bowel disease or uh, HIV or heart failure and iron deficiency. And so what you can see is that um, these are three different studies of patients with rheumatoid arthritis. The diagnostic criteria for iron deficiency was a little bit different in each of them going from, this would be the most rigorous and these would be a little bit less rigorous. And if you look at the percent of patients with uh, anemia, say it was 25% of which 13 had iron deficiency, 13 of 25 patients, so 52%. And so it can be anywhere from 20 to 50% of people with anemia and iron deficiency also, or and rheumatoid arthritis also have iron deficiency. So we shouldn't forget about iron deficiency and just say, oh, this must be some sort of anemia of chronic disease or something like that. In many different settings, the anemias of other concurrent illnesses is iron deficiency anemia. Um, most of what we focus on in hematology is thinking about where, what are the GI possibilities for uh, iron loss. Um, it's usually relatively easy to include or exclude um, um, say um, uh, uterine or, or um, menstrual losses uh, or, or sometimes diet, but it's not always so easy to, to identify GI causes of iron deficiency. Um, we do a lot of, uh, or recommend a lot of imaging studies and work with our GI colleagues often for this. The, um, the, the capsule endoscopy is only about 30% sensitive. So if you do that, there's, there's still a chance, even if you don't find anything, that there's a GI source of the iron deficiency, usually some occult blood loss that you just can't identify. And the way I think of it is that that uh, camera is sort of tumbling through the GI tract and it might be pointing at the wrong direction when the bleed is at the other side of the camera. So, um, so to do this a second time is not unreasonable if you really suspect iron deficiency. Now this is a, a paper from Israel where they have a large non-malignant um, hematology clinic or classical hematology with a focus on iron deficiency. And these, these were referred patients with, who had already been sort of screened by their primary care providers for causes of iron deficiency. And um, the, they looked at 300 patients and these are the, the diagnoses that they found ultimately that they thought were the cause of the iron deficiency. And even though uh, these patients were seen by either gynecologists or a primary care physician. Menorrhagia turned out to be the most common cause of what was thought to be occult iron deficiency anemia. Um, sometimes it's very hard to get a reliable history of menstrual bleeding, um, probably more from the observer than the patient. It, it can be difficult uh, to quantify that. And they were able to identify iron cause of iron deficiency in most of their patients, only 21 or 7% of that 300 patient uh, cohort were they not able to find a clear source of iron deficiency despite a more uh, advanced uh, evaluation of this. And these are the kinds of tests that you would do. I won't go through these in detail, but I think one to think about is always to look for celiac disease. Remember um, that the, there's a small area in the GI tract that can absorb iron. And it's the same area where celiac disease can be quite active. And iron deficiency, I would say, and celiac disease really go hand in hand. Um, so you may find somebody with iron deficiency and then subsequently diagnose celiac disease later. These are some of the things, these are not my pictures, but th these are things that we have seen over the years more than once. So I just, I just wanna highlight a few of these more unusual causes. So GAVE or a gastric uh, antral vascular ectasias or what's been called watermelon stomach can be seen and is, is very friable and can bleed. Um, the one that, that I think uh, surprises a lot of people are hiatal hernias. You have Cameron lesions. They can be subtle. There are these linear um, uh, erosions that can bleed, and they're, they're uh, typical in a hiatal hernia, and they're hard to see for the endoscopist. And so when I see somebody with a large hiatal hernia, even though you wouldn't think, oh, let's focus there for the iron deficiency, that is a known cause and, and not that rare. And lastly, we've seen some small bowel disease. We've seen small bowel malignancies and small bowel diverticulosis as causes of iron deficiency. 
So what have we learned? I think iron deficiency is, uh, can be difficult to diagnose. The diagnosis can be delayed and you sometimes need re repeated procedures to be able to identify it. And concurrent illnesses are common and they also make this diagnosis more, more difficult to establish. Um, so there have been other laboratory-based uh, diagnostic approaches. We've uh, published on the soluble transferrin receptor to see if that would be a, a good marker for iron deficiency. It, it turns out to be not really better than ferritin. There is a, a way to measure um, uh, reticulocyte or um, hemoglobin uh, iron, um, reticulocyte iron, which is that CHR. Um, some of the instruments do do that. Ours does something like that, but we don't report it. You, you could call the lab and ask for it, but it doesn't. it's not reported out. And then just measuring protoporphyrin, which is heme without iron has been done, um, but not very helpful. So we're kind of stuck with what we've got. Um, I'll, I'll just mention this very briefly. I think occasionally you'll see iron deficiency from hemolysis. This comes up probably more in hematology than anywhere else. So things like PNH, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria or other intravascular hemolytic diseases can do this, but they generally have to be long-term. You're not gonna lose that much iron in urine in a day, say, where, where you end up with hemosiderin or hemoglobinuria, um, so it's hard to do. And I just highlighted this one because I have seen a couple people that I, I'm convinced have this. It's hard to prove, but there's something called foot strike hemolysis. It used to be called uh, March hemoglobinuria. These are people that generally run more than um, 10,000 steps a day. So, and it's that foot striking that, that can cause the breakdown intravascular iron. So these are generally very healthy people um, and, uh, and, and they can lose iron um, through, the, through their foot strike hemolysis. Generally people that run on concrete or asphalt um, with, with maybe not as well padded shoes. So there are ways to get around this. Uh, I have uh, one patient who runs and she can tell when her hemoglobin gets down to about seven or eight or so, and then she knows that she can't run quite as fast, but she's still running 10K or more a day. And uh, so I'm, I'm envious. Um, and, and she has, uh, gets every supplemented every so often uh, with, with iron. So sometimes it's not easy to diagnose this, as I mentioned. So the treatment with empiric iron can be the gold standard here to figure out what's going on. Um, and we'll talk for a few minutes about oral iron. This is something very common. I think it's important for people in, um, to, to just have some basis for because we, we don't talk about it very often, but it's such an important problem and issue. Uh, most of the iron that we give is a ferrous salt. So it's mostly ferrous sulfate, but there are other ferrous salts, ferrous gluconate, ferrous fumarate that are available. And when we order a 325 of ferrous sulfate, 65 milligrams of that is the iron. So remember a physiologic amount is about 10 or 15 milligrams. So even one iron sulfate is giving a lot of iron. Um, if you take ascorbic acid or vitamin C or uh, any citric juice, you'll get, you know, increase the absorption, can increase the toxicity. And the new, newer regimens just recommend one or two tablets in the morning, either daily or every other day. And that has become the standard. Um, and it seems to be much more effective with improved adherence than, than the old TID regimens, which I think now are just about um, kind of on the trash heap of, of thinking. Um, it takes a few days to see a response and, and a perfectly healthy bone marrow that is uh, adequate except for not enough iron. Once you give iron, you should be able to increase the hemoglobin about two grams every three weeks. So it takes time to not only replete the red cells that are naturally dying off, but then also to be able to build up the, the normal red cells. And this again, this is the same uh, image, but, but not as pretty of looking at the hepcidin levels and they go up as soon as the iron uh, reaches the bloodstream. So this is in this study, this was the seminal study that showed giving um, two doses of 60 milligrams of iron in the morning is better than three divided doses. Um, uh, and so this led to this change in, in how we approach this problem. Um, so, and, and I think the, the, the one sort of still caveat that I would say about this or hesitation I have is th these studies have been done on mostly healthy women with uh, menstrual bleeding or pregnancy. 
So we don't know if this is perfect in people who have more complicated iron deficiency anemias. Um, but, but in general, this is the accepted way to do iron nowadays. <clears throat> and I won't spend much time on this. These are just two studies that look at various tweaks of this regimen. These are both pretty recent. So this is an active area of research uh, to still look at how much iron to give. The top one, again, fairly straightforward. Um, women with uncomplicated iron deficiency anemia, and they gave 160 milligrams of oral iron uh, as 80 milligrams each. And you can see that there was no difference if you did it daily or every other day in the recovery of the iron. And uh, similarly, in the lower study, they used terrorist fumarate, a similar type of iron, uh, and showed a similar thing. Here they did uh, three times a day versus three times a week. So it's three pills a week versus uh, 21 pills a week. And here you can see, I think this may be subtle, but it, I think it's important that the recovery with the three times a week is a little bit slower than the recovery with the three times a day. So if you look at week four, the hemoglobin recovers a little faster. So I think there is room to go up more than just three times a week for, the, for oral iron. This is just kind of a, a global view of iron. This, I, I, before COVID, I used to go to um, one of the um, pharmaceutical stores and I'd just stand there and look at irons and my wife would be getting stuff. And I would just look at all the irons and look at the bottles and what was in them. And I, I, I think she thought that was a little odd, but, um, but you can kind of um, uh, group them like this. There are the ferrous salts. They're the low, slow release irons, which are much better tolerated, but because they're slow release, that iron is past the absorptive capacity of the of the duodenum before before they're released. So they they are better tolerated, but they're also um, not as effective. There's an iron polysaccharide that I think nephrologists use relatively commonly, and then there's a carbon yell or a microsphere of iron that can also be used. These are like 2018 or 19 prices, so I, I'm sure they're up a little bit. There are many other ways to give iron. There's like a whole rack of irons in, in, in the pharmaceutical section. Um, but really, all these other things are more gimmicky unless you're deficient of something else. You can even get an oral contraceptive, for example, that has iron in it, but but the, which raises the price. It doesn't really add much uh, um, as far as the iron goes. And then there's also been a sort of a rebirth of using cast iron skillets that don't have any coating like Teflon on them. So they want to favor because your food sticks to them. It's harder to cook, but some of that iron will be <clears throat> in the food and you can get iron that way. So you can buy a, a skillet on Amazon that's just cast iron and get some iron that way. And some people like to do that as well. And then I've looked at um, uh, Impossible Meats, Impossible Burgers, and they have a fair amount of iron uh, in them. They have a heme, uh, a plant heme that has iron in them. So a, an Impossible Burger has four or five milligrams of iron, similar to a, to a hamburger from, from meat. Um, so again, the, the responses should be about two grams every three weeks, um, <clears throat> but there are inadequate responses uh, and it, it, they're defined in, in the literature as failure of 100 milligrams or more of oral iron after about four to six weeks of therapy. So um, you don't have to wait six months and, uh, to see if somebody's gonna respond to iron. You can move on sooner than that and get somebody feeling better. And then there's a variety of reasons. Um, either maybe you made the wrong diagnosis or there may be intolerance or noncompliance, which is probably the most common reason people don't respond, as well as a lot of other uh, reasons that people don't respond well to oral iron. And I think you're probably familiar with those. There, there's something that we do commonly um, that, I, that I learned from Mark Fleming, who's a pediatric, uh, he's a pathologist actually in Boston, and he developed this iron challenge that he used for research studies to see if people had abnormalities in their hepcidin pathway. And so, so we adopted that to just do in the clinic. And here's what we do. Um, and the, the end point, basically you have somebody fast, so their hepcidin would be very low. Uh, um, and then if you're doing a research study, you would measure hepcidin, but you would just give a fixed amount of liquid iron. So this is meant to only find the most severe malabsorptive processes. Some people can absorb liquid iron, but they can't digest it very well from foodstuffs. Um, 
and so the iron and then measure the iron again and it should go up twofold now more recently this other study is uh is another way to do this and so the 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 challenge is about the same, but what they looked at was they were able to divide their their um, patients into three groups. The ones whose the delta, the iron did not go up by 50 milligrams. They were poor responders. There was an intermediate group. And then there were these people who had a large um, uh, increase in their iron after they took in oral iron. So those would be normal responders to iron. And so it's similar, just a different endpoint. This is not standardized. But in, in my experience and, and what's in the literature, bariatric surgery patients, particularly Ruan Y, which is very malabsorptive, most of these patients do not absorb iron very well. And um, I think we've, we've talked about this. It's just another way to predict oral iron. Um, you can look at day 14. If the hemoglobin hasn't gone up by a gram, by day 14, it's probably not gonna go up. So if you wanna try to make a decision about other workup or other therapeutic alternatives, you could do this within a couple of weeks um, to know whether iron, uh, the person will respond to iron or not. So we'll finish talking a little bit with about IV iron. Again, another very uh, robust topic. Um, IV irons are very similar. These are microspheres of iron um, that uh, have a, a carbohydrate shell. So in that sense, they're all very similar. Um, iron sucrose, which is uh, venifer, has a sucrose shell with an iron core. Ferrogluconate, which is um, uh, ferlicit, is similar, but instead of having sucrose as the shell, it's a gluconate uh, a carbohydrate based structure. Um, and the reason you want that is if you just gave somebody iron, free iron, you, you could kill them. There are deaths in children from just taking iron uh, and because it can, it, if it's just free iron, it will go to the, the cells predominantly in the heart and lead to heart failure. It will damage the mitochondria in the heart. So the, really the difference between the irons is how this shell uh, and core size uh, are different. There are um, six different irons commercially available. Dan Coyne was instrumental in doing some of the studies with the, the low molecular weight uh, iron dextrans uh, in fed is the brand name. Um, these, these were the early irons, the lower uh, intensity color, was, they're considered first generation irons. And then we've added some second generation irons, ferric gluconate and iron sucrose. Ferric gluconate still has a place because it is a generic product. So it's very inexpensive, but you can't give very much of it because it, it leaves the carbohydrate shell very easily. And so you can make somebody toxic from it. Um, and so it's found a home in doing dialysis patients because they're coming in all the time anyway. And so you can give low dose iron on a frequent basis and not really interrupt anybody's schedule because they're coming for dialysis. And then the third generation irons that are available are shown here in the darker color. Um, they're, they're similar again in their structure. Um, there are some subtle differences in the indications uh, in the dosing and the administration. But um, we tried to use these, but sometimes often we're blocked by insurance too. So we generally try an iron dextran first or venifer. Those are the two, uh, the iron sucrose, which are the two that are easily available. And then the others we have to sort of work in uh, as, as needed. Um, this just shows some very basic studies that shows that the third generation irons work better than a placebo, as you might expect. And in some settings, they can work about as well as oral iron. So there's certainly no worse, but you can get a similar response to, to oral iron as IV iron. So often the problem with oral iron is, is just the tolerability rather than the efficacy. And here's just very few studies comparing different IV irons, but here's one with thermoxetol. Um, in which the, the, I didn't mention this, but the coating, that carbohydrate coating is proprietary. So you don't know exactly what it is. It's a synthetic carbohydrate um, and comparing that to iron sucrose. And again, from baseline hemoglobins, the responses are similar. So, so I don't think there's a lot of daylight in the efficacy between the irons. It's a little bit more subtle than that. It's dosing and ease of administration and cost are some of the drivers of which iron to use. Um, this is something that is, it was in the trash heap of, uh, of medical knowledge, I think, for a while, but I 
to me, it's made a little bit of a recurrence. It's what's called the Ganzoni's equation by uh, Dr. Ganzoni. The original paper is in German. Um, and it's a, a relatively simple formula for figuring out what an iron deficit is, how much how, uh, uh, low iron is. And then this is in a more recent uh, article, they had patients that had known iron deficit or calculated iron deficits by the Ganzoni equation. And they gave a dose close to the iron deficit and one that was suboptimal, and then looked at the percent of patients that reached a hemoglobin of 12. So this is maybe indirect data, but this, this some shows that if you don't reach the Ganzoni target, you may not uh, reach the, the, the maximum hemoglobin. So I think this, this is worthwhile. And the reason I think it's made a little bit of comeback in my mind is because now we have these different irons at different doses. So we can target our, our treatment a little bit more carefully rather than just say giving everybody a gram of iron. You can have a little better idea of how much iron people need. Um, uh, just a couple of slides on the risks. I think everybody is familiar with the idea that IV irons have some risk of anaphylaxis. This is from a large uh, Medicare database um, of looking at many thousands of iron IV iron users, particularly in the dialysis setting. And then these were reported adverse events. So there's always some concern about the, the validity of data like this, but they did show that iron dextran has the highest number of um, adverse events, highest, highest risk. The problem with this is this study was done before, while the high molecular weight iron dextrans were available, which clearly has a higher risk than the, the newer low mo uh, molecular weight iron dextrans. So, and it's usually in the first or second um, uh, dosing of this that you have the reaction. And I think you get the sense too that iron sucrose or venifer tends to be a little bit safer based on data like this. Um, so when we have somebody that we think may have had trouble with iron, um, we, we, uh, we would go to iron sucrose or venifer as kind of our backup. In the package insert for these drugs, they say that using one iron does not preclude using another if, uh, if the person's had a reaction. And then there are a bunch of non-anaphylactic reactions that are I've tried to characterize these. This is a difficult topic to, to kind of uh, sort through, but there are some hypotensive reactions perhaps rela uh, related to release of free iron in the um, circulation. There are other infusion reactions. Um, you can slow the rate or switch agents and sometimes get around these. These are not, uh, not allergic uh, in that sense. One thing that's also probably underappreciated is that antihistamines are not recommended. So Benadryl is not required. And, and we've stopped using Benadryl in, in the um, cancer center as a routine for people with IV iron. It, does, it seems to, if anything, have a little bit higher risk of, of a reaction. And as I mentioned, if you're intolerant to one, it doesn't mean you'll be intolerant to another. There, the other reaction that I wanna mention is that's risk of infection. So it's not really known, but many bacteria are siderophores. They like iron, they use them. And so you, if you have somebody with an active pneumonia, say, and you give them IV iron, you may give them a little burst of bacterial growth and, and um, they will look quite sick. And this has happened a couple of times. It is, it is not well-defined, but I think um, it, it does occur uh, rarely. So you have to be careful. We've put in a, a qualifier in, in heme clinic to not to make sure people aren't febrile when we give iron. So at least a little bit of a safety valve there. Um, and then hypophosphatemia has been seen. Um, it's thought it's particular to the ferric carboxymaltose. Um, and it, it, it's a, um, it, there's a, a phosphate um, a protein that I, that I think is inhibited by the ferric carboxymaltose that can lead to uh, increased phos phosphate um, that is transient, but it can be severe. Um, mostly you hear about this from people that are selling the other irons so that um, they want you to be aware of the reaction that can occur with this iron. And I'm going to end on with two, uh, a couple other quick ideas about iron because it's important in other fields. We've already talked about, I was thinking about this um, as I put this together. We've talked about a lot of different aspects of medicine. We talked a little bit about sleep medicine getting involved in iron deficiency, right, with restless leg and and um, other specialties. So this really goes across lines 
uh, GI, for example, not just hematology. And I just want to add a couple other brief ones. So this is um, looking at chemotherapy-induced anemia, which is common, and whether there's a role for IV iron um, before people get too anemic. So um, this study was, was um, in people who had a malignancy, non-hematologic malignancy, that were being actively treated that had sort of maybe iron deficiency anemia or maybe not, just based on the TSAT and, and the ferritin. They weren't the, the classic iron deficiency pattern. Uh, and they gave two doses of ferric carboxymaltose uh, compared to placebo. And, and the way they reported this data is after they gave that, what are the chances of becoming anemic? So the red is placebo. You were more likely to become anemic after just getting a placebo in this setting as opposed to getting iron up front. So um, uh, there's no survival data, but this is the first randomized study that looked at this. We do use a fair amount of iron in um, non-hematologic malignancies, but this is at least one study that showed that there may be some benefit to that. So you can stay on schedule with your, with your um, chemotherapy and you can avoid blood transfusions and other complications. And then the other field, which is obviously a big field, is uh, heart failure. Um, there have been several studies as early as 2009 looking at giving iron supplementation in people with congestive heart failure. Within the last six months or so, maybe closer to a year, there were two studies published very similar. One was positive and one was negative, looking at iron in heart failure. So one is with ferric carboxymaltose and the other is with this isomaltose uh, form of iron. Um, they were very similar. So you can see the criteria. Both of the pa both of these studies had patients with low ejection fractions, 40% in one, 45% in the other. They used similar uh, anemia criteria to enroll patients and similar iron criteria to enroll patients. And again, these are patients that had plus minus iron deficiency. It's hard to know just based on this. They're, they're in a gray zone and they received one of these irons versus placebo uh, in both cases, um, and then looked at the outcomes. In this paper that was just published in New England Journal within the last month, there was no difference in uh, they, the primary endpoints in both studies were heart failure uh, that required hospitalization or a cardiovascular death. In this study, there was no difference. In this study, there was a little bit of improvement with patients that got iron under these circumstances. So maybe it is, I don't think it's the type of iron, it may be the selection criteria or something else. I, I, I haven't fleshed that out. Maybe a, a cardiologist would be able to help us think about this in a different way, but there, this is still an area of, of very active research, obviously, trying to improve heart failure. So uh, on that note, why don't we stop? And just to summarize, um, anemia is very common in a variety of settings. We've looked at a lot of different situations. Their advances in iron metabolism have been striking, really, and they've um, led to increased diagnosis for patients with iron deficiency, uh, the correct diagnosis. Um, laboratory evaluation of iron deficiency is often helpful, but it can be inconclusive. Um, there is not a perfect test to be able to define this. I think probably a bone marrow exam is the best but that's not something you wanna do on everybody with anemia in general. Um, uh, most iron deficiencies uh, have a GI etiology. So that's what I tell patients, focus on the, uh, we're gonna focus on your GI tract to try to figure this out. Um, I think the oral iron challenge helps us here to be able to sort this through. Um, and oral iron is the mainstay of therapy, but there are new IV iron products that are safe and convenient. Um, of course, they're more expensive, but the case for iron IV iron is not always conclusive, but I think because these products are, are good, they'll still likely to increase in usage. So on that note, thank you for listening. I appreciate it. We'll, we'll go out and have uh, steaks for dinner tonight, right? <laughs>
I can answer that one first or try, and then if you have another one. So I think I think that it's hard to know at a population level if, it, if it's making an impact in how much iron deficiency we see, but definitely, and there is a hierarchy, and I don't remember off the top of my head, but there's about a 50 or 100 fold difference that I could get that for you of which of the uh, oral um, acid blockers, PPIs are, are the ones that are most uh, damaging to iron uh, absorption. That, that data is known, and I just don't remember off the top of my head, but you can look at three or four in, in a hierarchy of how much um, uh, iron is blocked. Did you have another one? There are a couple large population studies that show us uh, a relative risk uh, that's modest of venous thrombosis and iron deficiency. That is true. There is a link there. Um, the factor eight, I think, is probably more linked to inflammation. Um, and, and that is also true that that is a risk factor. We don't typically look at it because there's not much we can do about it, but, but it is a known risk factor for thrombotic disease. So both of those are. Thanks, Vicki. Thanks. Yes, it's extraordinary. Yeah.